I'm Bronwyn Maddox, I'm the Director of the Institute for Government and we're delighted to hear, uh, here to have our Gavin, Gavin Barwell who has just been giving his maiden speech in the Lords, departing a bit from the convention that the maiden speech is uncontroversial and uh, discussing uh, Brexit which has indeed been picked straight up by Twitter and so on. He was, and the thing that he's mainly going to talk about tonight is he was Chief of Staff for Theresa May from 2017 to the last days of her administration and before that Minister for London, Minister for Housing and Planning and of course a government whip and MP for Croydon Central from 2010 to 2017 and grew up, um, or you said from four months, which definitely counts in my book, grew up in Croydon as well where he still lives. So we're delighted to have him here this afternoon to talk about uh, being Chief of Staff but really you know, getting government to work in many ways and he gave a, a, a really excellent interview um, a Ministers Reflect which some of you will have read I really urge you to read and indeed an interview on our podcast last week um, not overlapping those, those were uh, all a series of extremely interesting points um, indeed about being, being a Minister Gavin thank you very much indeed for coming here to talk about this and you're going to talk for a bit you said at the beginning not too long about your thoughts on being Chief of Staff and I will um, ask him some questions, but I'm going to leave a uh, good time for you all to ask questions because I have the sense already that there are quite a lot. We finish, though, dead on 7 o'clock, um, but Gavin is very kindly going to stay, uh, and I hope many of you will stay for a glass of wine afterwards, and then he has to get back to the Lord. Thank you very much for joining us. Okay, well, thank you, um, Bronwyn, and thank you to the um, Institute for uh, hosting me here uh, today. Um, I became Chief of Staff to the Prime Minister in the immediate aftermath of the 2017 election. I lost my seat. The result was declared in the early hours of Friday morning. Uh, I went home to bed because I'd been up for about 30 hours at that point. Uh, and then I did a, a media interview on the Saturday morning talking about why I thought the election had gone wrong. And as I came out of the BBC New Broadcasting House, uh, number 10 switchboard called me and said the Prime Minister wanted to talk to me. And I assumed she was phoning around, offering her commiserations to the 30-odd people who'd lost their seats. And indeed, that is how she started. And then she caught me completely by surprise by saying, would I like to come and be her chief of staff? And I obviously said yes. Uh, but I quickly discovered there wasn't a sort of set uh, job description. Uh, and so I thought I might perform a little bit of a public service this evening by setting out what I think uh, the role involves. Although I will start with a caveat, which is that the, it turns out that the reason that there is no set job description is it varies a lot, depending on the particular circumstance. And I think there are probably four things First of all, the Prime Minister you're working for and, and what they want you to do. Uh, secondly, the character of the Principal Private Secretary and the Cabinet Secretary and, and how those three roles uh, interact. Uh, thirdly, the political situation. Uh, and in my case, clearly, we had a government that didn't have a majority, was in a confidence and uh, supply arrangement with the, the DUP. And even within the Conservative Party was fundamentally divided on the, on the key issue that the government was trying to achieve. So it was uh, challenging at times. Uh, and then also a little bit about your background. So I was the first person to do this job who'd been an MP and had been a minister. Mm. And I think that probably had some uh, impact on the way I did it because it certainly meant that MPs of all sides knew me much more than was probably the case for previous chiefs of staff. Um, but uh, having said all that, uh, I would outline for you, um, I would say probably eight, seven, sorry, seven uh, elements to the job. Um, first of all, clearly, you're the Prime Minister's most senior political uh, advisor. You see nearly everything that comes to the Prime Minister, and you can attend nearly every meeting uh, the Prime Minister has. And there is a bit of the job which is just about telling truth to power. I can recall a few occasions where you know, the Prime Minister would be uh, in her office thinking about something, and a whole array of people would say, you know, we really should tell the Prime Minister not to do that, or she ought to do this. And everyone would like look at you and say, well, you go and tell her then. Um, <laughs> because ultimately someone... And actually, it's very valuable to Prime Ministers that there is someone who can go into private room and say, look, Prime Minister, no one wants to say this to you because they know you're not going to like it, but this is the unanimous view of your officials and, and political advisors. Uh, the second role is to manage the other political advisors within Number 10 and, to a degree, uh, the political advisors around the rest of government. Clearly, if you're a special advisor to the Chancellor, your direct reporting line is to the Chancellor of the Exchequer, but ultimately the Prime Minister appoints all political advisors, so you want to try and create a team culture amongst them. The third job, and I would underline this very strongly, is to work really closely with the Prime Minister's Principal Private Secretary, who's the most senior civil servant in Number 10, so Bernard, for those of you who draw your experience based on the, um, the TV programme. 
Uh, and together, your job really is to set the tone within the building. And for whatever reason, I inherited a situation where didn't, even the conversations I had with people over the first few days, it clearly had not been a particularly happy environment for, in the previous few months for whatever reason. Clearly, the election result made that even more uh, difficult. So I thought a key part of the job was to try and set the tone. Number 10 is always going to be an incredibly stressful place to work, but it should be an enjoyable place to work despite that uh, stress and getting the atmosphere right is clearly important. The fourth role is a sort of gatekeeper role. You physically sit right outside the Prime Minister's office, so as long as you occupy your space for all waking hours of the day, <laughs> no one can get in to see the Prime Minister without going past you. But you're not just physically uh, a gatekeeper. Uh, a lot of people in the civil service and a lot of politicians can't easily get to the Prime Minister, but they can definitely get to you. Uh, and so they will come to you and say, what is the pro I've got this cutting plan to solve X problem. Can you tell me that the Prime Minister will be OK if I go ahead and just do this now? Uh, so you need to know uh, the Prime Minister's mind. Um, the fifth job is to work with all of the other officials in private office, all of the other private secretaries uh, and the excellent um, SPAD and official team in the policy unit to try and get this enormous government machine to do what the Prime Minister wants to do. And certainly in my time, quite a big chunk of my job was about brokering deals with other ministers. Uh, clearly, the Prime Minister had been in a position of huge political power within the government prior to the general election and wasn't in such a strong position after the general election. Uh, and therefore, quite often, you'd have to have some kind of trade-off. The Prime Minister wanted this. What could we do in return for that minister that would uh, get that there? And they, uh, you, you can't, in doing the job, do that across all government departments. So there are clearly uh, areas that you prioritise. The sixth job is to be a look, uh, with the opposition. Um, and actually, that can be quite rewarding on certain occasions, particularly, I found on sort of when you had national security issues, so uh, when the Prime Minister authorised the use of military force uh, against uh, the Assad regime over the use of chemical weapons, when we were working out the response to the attempted murder of the Skripals by the Russian state, ensuring that opposition leaders had Privy Council briefings, were aware of some of the underlying information that the government had at its disposal, tended to give a much better response in the House when the Prime Minister was then coming forward and taking action. And the last job was to be like a human Swiss army knife, just a little bit of everything. So I certainly did a little bit of speech writing. I would sometimes help James Slack out, who's the Prime Minister's official spokesman, with briefing on some of the complexity uh, of Brexit. You're occasionally used as a link with other chiefs of staff for other governments that you're trying to negotiate with. And I think that was partly a result of my greatest failing, which is I don't delegate enough. Um, uh, but nonetheless, you, you know, you'll occasionally turn your hand to whatever is the most important issue of the day. I just wanted to make um, two other sets of points and then take questions. Uh, I thought I'd say a little bit about what I found difficult about the job. The first thing is it is completely life-consuming. Um, you, you, the hours you do in the office are bad enough, but you never ever get away from work because if there's a terrorist attack or uh, if something, some other major event happens, uh, you're going to get called just before the Prime Minister gets called. As I said, ministers, even very senior ministers, will not generally want to pester the Prime Minister all weekend, but that doesn't stop them doing it to you. Uh, so, you know, my wife, who's in the audience tonight, will attest that I was generally home at weekends, but I wasn't present because I was almost <laughs> constantly on telephone conference calls or reading speeches or dealing with individual calls. From my phone has this great feature in my contacts where it tells you the five people in your contacts that contact you the most. And my wife used to monitor that, and Julian Smith and Philip Hammond were often ahead of her, um, <laughs> which, which was an issue. The third thing, which I think is sort of uh, a reflection, again, of my personality, is the contrast between being Chief of Staff and being Housing Minister in terms of dealing with 101 issues on any one given day. My natural inclination and preference is to study something in detail, understand it properly, take some time before reaching conclusions about what to do. You just can't do that. You have to trust the people in the policy unit and the private secretaries that are providing you with very succinct advice about what the situation is and what the options are and just make quick decisions, otherwise the whole of government is going to ground to a halt. The third thing, again, probably personal, is that I, I went from a situation where for seven years I'd been an MP and for four years I'd been a minister and, and therefore had my own political voice and, if you like, was uh, an actor on the political stage. And then you go to this job where actually you're much closer to the centre of power and what's actually happening, but you don't have a voice. Uh, and that was something that I found difficult. The fourth thing is obvious, which is that Brexit over the two and a bit years increasingly dominated everything. 
uh, and, it, and it got worse the longer that period uh, went on for, and that was hugely frustrating for everybody involved because there were so many other things that you would have wanted to devote more of your time to. And the fifth, and I think this is probably a challenge for any number 10, is how do you stop groupthink? You're in an office, it's actually quite a small building, uh, where there's a small group of people who are spending a very large amount of time together. And how do you ensure that you have a diversity of voices among that group of people and you don't end up all thinking the same thing? And if I would recall one particular incident that I think illustrates that problem really well, there was an occasion when the Prime Minister, during the Brexit process, went out and gave a statement which vented her frustration with MPs uh, about their failure to take any positive decision about what they wanted. And I still, to this day, think she was right in what she said, but it wasn't the right thing to do because it didn't help her cause of trying to get Parliament um, to come to a conclusion because you know, MPs were having a hard enough time from their constituents about what was happening and the Prime Minister saying it made them feel angry rather than encouraging them to resolve the matter. So that groupthink danger, I think, is always there. Um, then a couple of reflections on the civil service. You know, I found the quality of the civil servants that I dealt with at number 10 exceptional. I'm not just saying that because there's a few of them in the room tonight. We well, had noticed um, and wanted. The, uh, the logistics uh, that the, the, are there to the support the Prime Minister and therefore by proxy to support you are Rolls-Royce standard. Um, there was far too much focus on policy making and not enough on implementation and whether actually either the things the Prime Minister had said wanted to happen were actually happening, or if they were happening, were they having the desired effect uh, that had been behind the thinking behind that policy. I don't think that's just the fault of the civil service. I think that is partly the pressure of politicians always wanting new announcements and the sort of media cycle that we have in this country, always you know, the need to generate news and new stuff rather than actually focus on what's working. Um, the two frustrations I would, I would put down to the civil service are, I think, departmentalisation is a huge problem, and I talked about this a little bit in the Minister's Reflect about housing, uh, in terms of, you know, DC, MHCLG doesn't have all of the housing policy levers within its area, and it's actually very difficult to get all the people in one room to decide something. And there's too rapid turnover of senior uh, policy officials. Um, four very quick final thoughts. Uh, an innovation that I had at least something to do with that I'm really proud of is the legislative affairs team at number 10. Uh, you know, I think it obviously will be less necessary for this government with the size of the majority it has, but there wasn't sufficient expertise in number 10 in a hung parliament uh, about actually how parliament worked. And I think the team that Nikki de Costa put together there uh, was a huge success, and I hope it's an innovation that will stick. Um, my experience was SPADs don't need the power to direct civil servants. Uh, if officials believe that one, uh, you know the Prime Minister's mind, and two, you are accurately representing the Prime Minister's view, not what you want to happen, then if you say this is what the Prime Minister wants, they will go ahead and do it whether you have a power to direct them or not. Um, third thought, and this might be something that some people would criticise me over, having been a SPAD in a department years ago, I actually found this role less political. Because there were lots of SPADs in number 10, there were lots of people's job to be the political person and actually I thought my job uh, most of the time was to make sure the Prime Minister was getting the right advice from politicians and officials and the whole process was well run and there was good input from across uh, the party. And then my final thought comes from a book that I would encourage those of you who that are interested in, given you've turned up here on a Monday night you're all fairly interested I guess, there's a book called The Gatekeepers by Chris Whipple which is a history of the Office of Chief of Staff to the President of the United States and he has one chapter on each person who occupied the office. And I read it in the first few weeks doing the job. And there's one thing that really stuck with me, which was, I think it was one of Obama's chiefs of staff said, chief of staff, the important word in the job title is staff, not chief. It is very easy doing this job to believe that you're a really important person because the civil service treat you incredibly well. And as I said, you get this whole queue of people coming to you for decisions, but you are there to get what the Prime Minister wants done, done. You are not there as a political actor in your own right, and bear, bearing that in mind will serve you in good stead. Thanks very much indeed. <laughs> Thanks very much indeed for that sort of mini handbook of tips you've given us um, already. Let me, let me start by asking you something that Jonathan Powell um, said about the, uh, speaking obviously of the, the Blair government, but said that he was struck, and he said this in um, an interview with us uh, uh, very, very recently, um, said he was struck by how little power number 10 had, and it was really, if you're working there, it was really about 
persuasion, not about telling people what to do. Is that, is that your feeling? Well, if Jonathan Powell said that, having worked for Tony Blair with huge majorities, okay. then um, okay. way beside the rest of us. So I think, I think that... When, when you took the job, you, you knew the government had lost its majority, but it obviously hadn't done a deal yet. No, I mean, it, the person I, the, at the point the at which I took the job, um, I knew that Theresa was having to go to the 1922 committee mm. on the Monday, 48 hours after I said yes, um, mm. to talk about the election and what had happened. And, you know, it could have been a pretty short-lived stint, the job. Um, but I, I would say two things and I'd say. It's certainly true that number, they actually, if you go behind, people talk about number 10 as if it's a house. Actually, those three buildings, number 10, number 11, number 12, behind the facade are one building that is the office of the Prime Minister, effectively. But it's not a huge team of people. So the departments hold the policy expertise. Um, you clearly have some real political power. First of all, you have the power of patronage. You choose who your cabinet is. But I think to a lesser extent than in the US, but it's still true, political power comes to a degree from the strength of the political position of the person at the top. So, you know, the US president, when they're, when they're riding high in the polls, their authority in Congress, even if, they haven't got, if their party hasn't got a majority, is still pretty strong. Uh, and certainly that was, you know, our experience. The, the best period that we had during my two years, there was a sort of six-month period from when we got the initial joint declaration on Brexit, just sort of pre-Christmas 2017, uh, and then, as I said, we had the, the attempted murder of the Skripals, we had the Syria mm. uh, airstrikes, we had the uh, achievement of the implementation period. That sort of six-month period was the period where you really felt we're beginning to recover from where we were immediately after the election, and the Prime Minister's political authority is growing, and then really post-checkers from, after that, from that point on, it was a, it was a real struggle. So look, you, you do have some real levers, but I think Jonathan is right um, that... You know, a lot of it is about persuasion and influence, both of your own colleagues and of the wider government machine. You very tactfully, and that didn't mention the names of the uh, Theresa May's uh, ad main advisers before you took over, uh, where they had departed the scene. I, I'm going to fail to keep that up, but uh, we've had uh, these communications from Dominic Cummings uh, over the Christmas period about some of the priorities he feels the government should, um, should uh, really get going on right away, including reform of the civil service. Do you think it is a, a, pr a priority for the government, that it is so essential to get rid of some of these frustrations that it really needs to be there on the table at the beginning? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I have some sympathy with some of the points that Dom mm -hmm. uh, made in that sort of blog post. Uh, and I've, I've touched on a couple of what I've said. I think, for example, he's absolutely right about too rapid turnover um, of uh, policy experts. Something, uh, something Institute has written a lot about. Yeah. Uh, and I think he's also right about trying to get a wider set of skills into the civil service. And I think it's, it's absolute, if I was in his position, absolutely a focus on trying to ensure that the government can deliver the things on which ultimately it's going to depend to get re-elected. Absolutely right to have that focus. It seems to me that the key is to take people with you. Uh, what, what you need to do in that job is actually, if you're trying to reform an institute, I think this is true for, if you take a minute, when you're Minister for Housing, or your Secretary of State for Education or Secretary of State for Health, you want to reform a public service, your, your prospects of doing that successfully are best if you actually persuade the people in that public service who you are relying on to deliver what you're trying to do if you carry them with you when you're doing that reform. So I think a lot of his diagnosis is good, but the key will be persuading civil service that he wants, civil service that he wants to work with them to change the institution that they're part of and make it a better one rather than it being seen as a sort of confrontational thing. And, and that they are the problem. I mean, the Institute was set up uh, out of uh, Chair David Sainsbury's frustration and some of the things that didn't work in government. And so we very much um, you know, agree with some of, some of the diagnosis. Yeah. Um, well, I think a lot of civil servants are frustrated yes. with some of the things about government. But, you know, we should recognise that's, that's a positive. They, they'll want to work with a government that, is, that believes in the, the values of the civil service but wants to make it work more effectively. Then I think you can take pe people with you and make those changes. Just on that one point, but it is of particular interest to us, on, on the turnover of senior uh, civil service um, people, how long would you like someone you're working with to be in, in post? So, like, the, Obviously, the, it depends a, on context. There is a selfish roughly. answer. Yeah. Okay? So I think if you're the Prime Minister or you're her Chief of Staff, yeah. and you have someone who is, for example, the Deputy PPS, yeah. who, is, who is the Treasury level person, and they're brilliant, you don't ever want them to leave. For as yeah. long as you're Prime Minister, you want to keep that person there because they're fantastic. And if you recruit someone else, of course, the civil service is going to offer up great candidates, but you've got to get to know them, you've got to build the relationship of trust. Now, set against that, people have lives. And you can't, these jobs are, in, you know, I just described what it was like being chief of staff for two years. Mm. It's the same if you're doing a senior job in private office or in the policy unit or whatever. 
and you're going to have people burn out if you don't allow turnover at all. Uh, so I think you've got to strike a balance. Um, but my experience, you know, if, if you, one of the things people used to say is it's how, when the first thing I went, the first time I ever went and did a talk as housing minister, the person who introduced me pointed out that the average life expectancy of a housing minister was 10 months, uh, which proved one month too short in my case. Um, but beyond, beyond the joke, he was saying that this can't be sensible, that the people driving policy are changing that frequently. And actually, with the officials, it wasn't a lot longer. It was a couple of years, maybe two, two and a half years. So a lot of the great officials that work with me on the housing white paper aren't in HCLG anymore. So you know, I'm not, I wouldn't give you a number, but I think you have to strike a balance between the need for a bit more continuity with a recognition that in some of these jobs, particularly in number 10, the pressures mean you're going to, people are going to burn out if you make them do it for too long. You, you, you said policy making wasn't the problem, implementation was, but let me just stick on that for a second because doesn't that enormously compromise policy making if you've got people doing it who actually haven't been studying it very long, they were doing yeah. something completely different Yeah, before. so you need, look, you need I, I mean actually I, would, I think it, you know, in any organisation what you need is a bit of a mix isn't it? I would say you want a mix of people from different age backgrounds, different uh, parts of the country, different ethnicities, you want to get those different viewpoints and actually if I think of the team that I had at MHCLG that worked on the white paper, we had two or three people that had been brought in from Cabinet Office or Treasury to try and lift the self-confidence of the department, which had had a hard time for a number of years in spending reviews and the like. But you also had two or three officials, Sally Randall's a good example, who was a genuine expert on social housing and had worked in that bit of the department for a long time. And I think having, maybe having a mix so that you get some fresh ideas coming in, but you've got some long-standing experts. Uh, is probably the right balance. So the idea of getting rid of ca cabinet committees and having COBRA-style meetings that bring people from right across the civil service and all kinds of different levels, a way of cracking some of these problems? So I don't really think, it, I think it matters what you call the meeting, whether it's yeah. COBRA or it's a cabinet committee, whatever. what matters is having the people around the table that have control, you know, that have the relevant expertise or policy areas that they're responsible for and the ability to deliver the decisions. Uh, I, I certainly don't have a problem at all with the, if the idea is to bring in some people who are not ministers but are in charge of some of the agencies that are delivering, yeah, sure. What about moving people out of London, um, which is recurrent, it's not just that it's a, a, a modish thing or a priority of this, this government, does it help or do we really need to run a centralised government with a lot of people here, particularly say in the Treasury, you know, working close, closely with each other? We had Labour before the election talking very energetically about, about moving uh, big parts of the Treasury out of London, though at the same time talking about the, uh, getting the Treasury to work much more closely with other departments? So beyond governance, I think we have a problem in this country that London is too dominant within the country. So I have to say yes in principle to the idea, but I think there are limits how far you can go. For so long as Parliament is lo in London, mm. ministers are going to have to be in London, and if ministers are going to have to be in London, then a good chunk of their senior officials are going to have to be around them. Now, there's definitely capacity I think, to move some out, but there are limiting factors unless you're actually going to move Parliament. If you were advising the government, you were talking about implementation, if you're advising the government on how to get something done, um, how to put more money successfully into the North or Midlands or something, what are, the, what are the bottlenecks or the obstacles in implementation that you came across? Uh, so I think um, there are several things. The first is getting collective agreement is not always yeah. easy. Um, so, like for this, you know, I, I would have thought there's pretty broad political consensus in Parliament at the moment that we should try and get more investment mm. into some of these um, left behind areas, if I can characterise them as that. Uh, but then, where is the money going to come from? Is it going to be taken away from some other programmes, or are we going to borrow more, or are we going to raise taxes to pay for it? Those are much more difficult questions to achieve consensus on. Uh, then, um, if you, if it, if the thing you're doing requires any legislation. Uh, you know, the processes there are very long. You'll normally have to do some kind of consultation first, then you have to legislate, then you need the secondary legislation to Im implement the detail of the primary legislation. Mm. So there's a definitely a sort of legislative process there, and I think we should definitely look at whether we can speed that up a bit. Again, there is a balance to be struck here between making, being able to deliver quickly versus proper democratic accountability where things can be scrutinised and challenged appropriately. Um, but then I think there is just an issue about the focus so of short, the machine. Uh, Short-circuiting some of the parliamentary procedures. Yeah, saying? and also, yeah. you know, I sometimes found you felt like you sort of consulted on something three times. You'd sort of consulted on it before you decided to do it, then you legislated, then you had to consult on the secondary, you know, it was just, 
sort of constantly running around the hoop. So maybe we can speed some of that up. Um, and uh, then I think you've got a sort of problem of focus, which is what happens at the moment, in my experience, is a large chunk of the machine, as soon as you've passed the relevant legislation, the attention turns to what's the next thing coming down the track and not what's our progress in actually delivering that. You know, and that was probably my, you know, obviously this, the job as chief of staff was an amazing experience to do. But one of my frustrations is what I really wanted to do was spend two years making sure that housing white paper was mm. implemented. And I, you know, we'd got a grid of 70-something uh, things that had to happen. Uh, and I'd be pretty confident without having checked before coming here tonight, some of them still won't have happened. Mm. Well, I was going to ask you exactly about that, because um, if you take housing, it's one of, um, it's been recognised for a long time, it's one of these enduring problems that minister after minister throws himself or herself at. And maybe bits of it improve a bit, but, but uh, it still remains right up there as um, acknowledged problem of the country. You come in as a minister, you may not know how long you're going to be there. You may not know, in your case, how long your uh, uh, government is going to be there. How do you go about trying to do something fairly quickly to make an impact on an enduring problem like that? So um, the first thing I would say is that housing is a particularly difficult issue because policy responsibility is split between a number of departments. So the Ministry of Housing does not actually control a number of the key levers. The Treasury has responsibility for stamp duty. It has a responsibility for huge market interventions like help to buy and some of the guarantees that we give to people to encourage them to build affordable housing or uh, what we call build to rent homes. Um, DWP is responsible for housing benefit or what is now wrapped up into universal credit but there's a lot of, there's a lot of money that is throwing, flowing into the housing world in my opinion in not a very effective way through the welfare system. So the first problem you've got is sort of this departmentalisation and an inability to get all of the sort of policy owners together to get a coherent uh, approach to it. The second thing that I think is difficult about housing is the, re the fundamental reason we have a problem in this country is that for a very long time we have not built enough homes. And so the honest thing for any politician to say is I cannot solve this problem in three or four years. It, it is impossible. You can, you can do some things to try and deal with the immediate, glaring, worst effects of the problem. You know, I think morally as a country we need to do something to get the number of people sleeping off our streets at the moment into some kind of accommodation because that should be a source of moral shame to us that people are sleeping on the streets in such numbers. But the underlying problems that are, that are, that of which that is the sort of tip of the iceberg, they cannot be dealt with in three to four years. Uh, and you need to be honest with people about that. Uh, I think for those kinds of long-term problems, and, and for example, climate change, how we are going to deliver net zero is a good example. Because the lifetime of what you're trying to do way exceeds a single political cycle, you actually want to try and build some cross-party consensus. You want to try and get a plan together that actually people can broadly coalesce around so that you can get some stability in policy. You know, in housing, I spent the first four or five months talking to everybody in the sector, and the main thing they said is, we're just sick and tired of the government just changing things all the time. What we need is some, we need the right policy and then leave it alone for a while and just let us get on with it, essentially. So I think trying, on those kinds of issues, trying to build some kind of cross-party consensus about where the solutions might be is necessary. Uh, and it's not easy, it's not been easy in the last couple of years for obvious reasons, but that, that has got to be a part of the answer. And the, the main thing I found when I came into that job, and this is something Theresa felt very strongly about as well, is that you'd, we'd got into this kind of weird argument where some people were saying the answer is private housing and some people were saying the answer is build more affordable housing. And like the answer was like both, like mm. just build more kinds of, more of every kind of housing mm. is needed. Um, so I would say those are the sort of key, mm. key starting points. So how long will it take to go, get Brexit done? Um, well, so that, that, that argument in the election is a, is a good example of the kind of... Uh, no, I'm asking seriously, I mean, because you're you raising know, questions you, about, 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 about expectations. I'm going to give you a proper answer, but the, the, the reason that question in the election campaign slightly annoyed me is... Look, first of all, it was a political slogan, and it was a very effective one, judged by the result of the election. Secondly, there was an element of truth in it, in that what we're going to get done on the 31st of January is we're going to get the existential decision made. Are we actually leaving or not? You know, we've had three years, three and a half years since the referendum when we vacillated around on the fundamental question. And we are going to get it done in the sense of answering the question. Now, if you then say to me, how long is it going to take to negotiate the future relationship? I think that's going to take several years. Mm. 
Uh, I don't actually, and I, I, this is what my speech today was about, as you know, mm. I don't actually think the big risk at the end of this year is no deal. I think the risk at the no, end of no this trade, year... No trade deal. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the risk at the end of this year is a sort of very basic, not covering everything deal, which is not, therefore, what I would ideally like to see. And I also think... That doesn't answer the questions of business. That, no, that, not that all of them, anyway. Describing. It'll answer yeah. some, but not all of them. But, yeah. And also, you know... We're in danger of repeating the mistake we made in the first phase. Right? In the first phase, what happened was, once we sort of felt we had no choice but to accept the EU's phasing proposals, we set up this thing where we're going to talk about the things that matter to them first before we get on to talking about all of the future relationship issues that we need to talk about. And it would have been much easier to handle politically if we were talking about all those things together. The backstop would not have got elevated to the issue it did if we'd been talking about all those things together. And the danger now is if you say, I completely understand why the government doesn't want to extend, but if you say we're not going to extend, it's impossible to do the whole future relationship, negotiate it, ratify it, give business the time to prepare for it by the 1st of January. So you're going to have to just do some stuff this year. And the moment you're in that situation and we're against a hard deadline, the EU is going to say, well, these are the bits we want done first. And they will feel they're in a stronger position. But even if they're not inclined to hardball us, they'll legitimately sort of say, well, look, if we don't include fishing in this deal, there's no way some of the national parliaments are going to ratify it, because that's the main thing for them that they're, they're worried about here. So it's, it, w it would be much better for us if you were dealing with these issues all as one, and that's my, that's my concern about boxing yourself in on a timeline. But I, I think it'll take several years to go through all the detail of the future relationship. Do you think, uh, I don't mean there's a leading question, but uh, do you feel we're in danger of, of um, replicating the... Um, problems of negotiation the first time round of letting, letting the EU set the agenda? It's not so much let it, it, it's, it was just the, the reality that we were under time yeah. pressure yeah. because of the Article 50. So you, you, you yeah. sort of thought, okay, well, if they want to talk about those things first, they are important issues, we'll get them done. But it, it's much easier for the UK if we're dealing with all of the things in a negotiation in one go rather than breaking it up uh, into chunks. So, yes, that's my concern. I just to be clear, I totally understand what their concern is, right? The, the, the implementation or transition period is deeply uncomfortable because mm. it's a period where we're paying money into the EU and we're having to follow EU rules and we no longer have a say in those rules. So I don't think anyone in this room, whatever everyone's views on Brexit may or may not be, mm. that's not an ideal situation. Mm. Um, so I totally understand why the government doesn't want it to go on any longer than uh, the minimum possible time. Um, but we have to think, you know, my point that I was trying to make today is we need to think through how are we going to get the best possible result from this negotiation? As a former whip, as well as former chief of staff, how would you advise the Prime Minister to deal with uh, Parliament at the moment? A whole new load of MPs, um, many of them um, you know, in seats that hadn't been Tory before, um, wondering you know, what they're going to make of, uh, of their time in Parliament, and again, very concerned about the constituencies that they now re represent. So the first thing I would say is you want a really good induction process for MPs. And that isn't totally in the Prime Minister's gift. Part of that is a responsibility for Parliament itself. Mm. And then the parties obviously supplement whatever Parliament mm. does with their own uh, induction processes. But allowing them to understand properly how Parliament works and how they can best do their job mm. is going to lead to people that are much happier mm. with their roles. Uh, and, you know... I didn't think the induction process when I joined was great, but I'm told it was significantly better than it had ever been before. Um, so it is a strange job, uh, and it's not obvious, particularly to people who've not been involved in the sort of Westminster Village before. Yeah. It's, it's not an easy thing to come to grips with. Um, the second thing I would say from the government's perspective is, you know, obviously we have a government with a very significant majority, and pretty much for the next five years, if the government decides it's going to do something, it's probably going to get its way. Um, but I think it's actually in the government's interest, even though it isn't under the pressures that the previous government was under, to nonetheless engage with MPs, keep them informed, listen to them about what their concerns are. Because actually, you know, I think one of my sort of frustrations with politics, I, I came into politics originally because I loved debating. And you said in one of your pieces, it brings ideas together with real life. Yeah, that's Doesn't what I love about politics yeah. generally. But the, the, the thing about debating, right, a lot of people think the thing about debating is being able to speak well. It's actually about being able to listen well. That's the key skill. The key skill in debating is to understand what is the other person saying and where's the strength in their argument and where's the weakness in their argument. And actually, I think when you're in a position where you've won, 
and you know, the Prime Minister deserves huge credit, he's won and won big, you actually have a lot to gain from listening to the other side, because often they'll say things you don't agree with or you think are wrong, but occasionally there'll be some good ideas there. And I think a confident government says, okay, that's interesting, we'll get that MP in and see if we can pick that up and do something with that. And, you know, and that's one of the things I thought that was interesting about Dom's blog. They are really in, the, they know what they want to do, and they're really in the market for ideas about how best to go about and, and do that. So I think even though they don't have to do it because of the strength of their political position in Parliament, engaging with Parliament, taking the time, having staff at Number 10 whose job is to listen to MPs of all parties and pick up issues from them and see where, where actually something might be going wrong, mm. is time well spent. Let me just ask you, before we come uh, to general questions, you talked about the, the, um, the eight, last eight weeks of Theresa May's tenure and that you got a lot done. Yeah. So, I mean, it was, um, it was a strange period, obviously, because uh, yeah, we were all absolutely shattered and, and also very sad that we'd not been mm. able to help the Prime Minister achieve what she was trying to achieve. But you did then have this period where, if you like, you weren't allowed to do anything on Brexit because that was clearly for the new leader to try and resolve. And it was like, OK, well, we've got eight weeks. What can we do? And it turns out the answer was not quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think actually when, you, when, when, he, when people look back from a longer perspective on Theresa's premiership, some of the things that she did in that last eight weeks will be seen as some of the most, you know, the, the decision on net zero, for example, I think is one of the biggest sort of long-term decisions uh, that her government uh, made. And so Did a lot of way, analysis and costing go into that? Yeah, well, I think a lot of what could, yes, because it wasn't something we just I, I think I out. agree with you. I mean, it's, it's, it's there, it absolutely resonates as a part of government policy. Yeah. On the other hand, it came Yeah, so I think uh, it wasn't something that was just plucked out because in a way it had been building up the agenda of the yeah. Climate Change Committee and people had done a lot of work on it. So, uh, yes, you know, that, and obviously if you'd done that over a long time scale, you, you'd have been able to do, there's no limit to what, the, as you know, you can do on these things. But no, there was quite a bit of thought that went the way into it. And we looked at a number of different areas that were important to the mm. Prime Minister. But I think for, for those of us that were involved in supporting her, if you like, it was a look at what a normal government would have been like that wasn't grappling with the Brexit. You just had this sort of eight-week window where that wasn't an issue and you could think about everything else. Let's have some questions. All right. Um, first up, was here. Hi, Nigel Fletcher from King's College. Um, Gavin, you said one of the frustrations was not having a voice um, as Chief of Staff. Um, do you think it's a problem when senior advisors to the Prime Minister maintain a public voice? Um, I think that's a judgment that each person has to make. Like, I think if, if, you become, if you become the story, that can be a problem, and that's something Alistair Campbell, I think, has said in the past. But I don't think that should preclude you from ever being able to say anything. And actually, sometimes it can be very helpful to the government if people have a clearer understanding of what key advisors are, are passionate about and are trying to push. So there's, a, there's a clearly a balance to be struck there. Here on the edge. Um, yeah, Alexander Dan. I'm also from King's College, if I don't know him. Um, <laughs> I'm very interested in the relationship between um, the ministers and the um, staff at number 10 and number 10 generally, not, uh, not just the Prime Minister but the Chief of Staff. To what extent do ministers have real autonomy or to what extent um, are they required to run initiatives, um, ideas, proposals um, and problems that they may have past the Chief of Staff or perhaps the Prime Minister? So, how does that relationship work? Or to put it another way around, is the Prime Minister premise into Paris still, or you talked about President of the United States, is the Prime Minister more of a de facto president? No, I, th I think more the former. I mean, clearly you have the formal sort of collective agreement processes. So if a minister wants to do something of any significance, they've got to get collective agreement from the re relevant cabinet committee, or if it's a really big thing, if you're publishing the, the housing white paper, that's going to need collective agreement from the whole government. But I would say quite often ministers would want to come and talk to you if they were looking to develop a particular idea because they wanted an early steer about what the Prime Minister might think about it. And as I said, often they were quite reticent about disturbing the Prime Minister at the weekend, I think probably particularly because they knew the pressure she was under on the Brexit issue. So the kinds of conversations you would have would be either where the Prime Minister wanted to push a minister to do something in their area or a minister was proactively coming to you and saying, look, I'm thinking about doing this and do you think the PM... Will be, will be happy with that. Generally, in my experience, ministers want to work with the grain of the Prime Minister if they can, but obviously they've been given that job by the Prime Minister and they, they want a degree of autonomy about how they, how they best can deliver it. 
But the main formal channels will be the collective agreement channels through the sort of cabinet committee process. Thanks for that. And at the door, and anyone else who's next door, please stick your head through if you want to ask a question. Thank you. Uh, Greg Rosen at Newington. Um, you mentioned that uh, you wish you had been able to sort out rough sleeping. And you said it with passion, and you clearly mean it. What does it say about the effectiveness of government that despite you evidently really wanting to have done that, you've been housing minister and you've been chief of staff to the prime minister that you weren't able to do it? What is the block there? And otherwise, what does it say to, to voters about the effectiveness of government if something that important that you so clearly care about, when you're at the centre of power, you can't resolve. Um, so look, what I would say uh, is that the, I think the first thing that it shows is that these things are complex and take more time than maybe most voters would expect them to take. Um, but I think it's also fair to make a little bit of implied criticism. You were, you were polite in the way you said it, but I think a voter would be, would be reasonable to make some criticism. Um, the, the first thing we did was got a clear commitment in the manifesto in 2017 to, to, to halve it and then to eliminate it entirely. Um, and there are, there's some additional money that's been put in and in those areas where the additional programmes have been trialled we are now seeing a fall. But I think you, could, you would be entirely justified in saying the pace of pursuing that hasn't been as rapid as it should have been. And I hope that that will now be accelerated and that is what I expect uh, to happen. I think it, it probably also speaks to um, the, the fact that although I am particularly passionate about that, there are so many other things the government is doing that people are equally passionate about delivering. And, you, and there's always, therefore, this sort of competition for resources. But I don't say that as an excuse because I personally think, although you know, that issue transcends, you know, it's, it's a fundamental sort of moral challenge. Um, what, the, the thing I used to try and say when I was housing minister about it is, there's a sort of distinction, if you like, between rough sleeping and statutory homelessness. And often when you talk about homelessness, people, the public will think you're talking about rough sleeping. The people who sleep rough generally, they have a housing problem, but the housing problem is a manifestation of some much more serious problems that they have in their lives. So there is some complexity in, in properly dealing with those issues. But I don't say any of that as excuses, and I think your challenge is a fair one. Thanks. Right at the back, and then I'm coming to people in the middle here. Um, well, Gavin, it's not true that it was a could, surprise. Could you say for the record who you are? Gina Bottomley. So I've been around some of these circles. I mean, rough sleeping is partly about civil liberties. People used to clear people off the streets and send them to prisons or to psychiatric hospitals. We don't want to do that anymore. So it's impossibly difficult. Forgive me. But I wrote to you immediately on the day after the election saying, come and see me about a job unless the Prime Minister is wise enough to ask her, you to be her Chief of Staff. And I think your sort of good natures, nature and your tenacity have been extraordinary. I've got a question and a half. I sort of say, in the old days, a lot of this would have been settled on Privy Council rules. I mean, a lot, a lot Corbyn, of what? The, 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 the Brexit saga. Right. So the difference between Jeremy Corden and Theresa May on Europe was not very great. And there would have been discussions by Willie Whitelaw, whoever it was, and he would have found, he would have said, this is in the national interest and we need to find agreement on five points and then you'll have two. Which are... So why was that completely impossible to happen? And my last comment, how did you cope with the bastards? Because most of you are not politicians, are you? How many politicians in the room? Right. When you no first... one's going to admit to it now. Anyway, <laughs> no. Right. When you become an, when I became an MP, I looked at in the comments. I didn't know whether they were playing rugby, tennis, netball, croquet, hockey, tiddlywinks, or cheat. So people in Parliament are all playing extraordinarily different games. And it's really, really hard to align them. And some people are just after the buggeration factor. And if you are in such a serious situation and you're the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff, I just want to know how you remain so emollient, decent, sort of lovable. Virginia, thank you. I, th I think that counts as a question. Um, <laughs> yes, and, and uh, despite the intimacy of this room uh, late in the evening, can I remind everyone we are on live stream? Welcome to you guys. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, 
I think the first thing I would say in terms of the failure to reach sort of cross-party agreement on this is that I think it is, it's quite difficult in our system because it's an adversarial system. I think I mean, one of the sort of critiques uh, that's made of Theresa is, well, you should have sort of got cross-party agreement at the outset before you started negotiating. But I think it would, it would both have been very difficult for her position in the Conservative Party if she tried to do that straight away. And I'm not sure if the Labour Party would have reciprocated it anyway. So I think it is difficult in our system. Actually, when we got round quite late in the day to having the cross-party talks, as Virginia is implying, we did basically reach agreement. But the problem was neither side believed that you would get enough MPs to, result, to vote for the resulting agreement. And you know, my, at some point, I may get around to writing a book about Brexit and what happened. But my simple, for tonight, my sort of simple version of it to you would be, think of Brexit as a maze. And there are, there are three ways out of the maze. You can leave with a deal, you can leave without a deal, or you can decide to revoke the whole thing. And the rule is, you only get to leave the maze if you persuade half of the MPs to walk through the same exit at the same time. And the reason we couldn't reach agreement is we were never able to do that. So you had one group of people who thought, if we, if we oppose Theresa's plan, we will get what we want, which is a, a harder Brexit. And you had another group of people who thought, if we oppose Theresa's plan, we will get what we want, which is a second referendum and a chance to reverse the whole thing. And it, we, we said to both groups, like, one of you has got to be wrong. And at the end of this process, one of you is going to really regret behaving the way that you have now. But the problem was we couldn't prove which one it was going to be. Now, history now tells us which one it was. Um, but that, I think, is why the cross-party process didn't work. In, in terms of MPs, I never... The people that I got angry with were the people who I felt agreed with what we were trying to do but wouldn't vote for it for political reasons. I never actually got angry with the people on either extreme of the argument, despite the fact that they were incredibly difficult sometimes, mm. because they were self-evidently doing what they passionately believed was the right thing. And it's quite difficult to get angry with people for that. You might disagree with them, you might think you're wrong, but if someone is prepared to vote against the whip um, because they passionately feel that they don't agree with the government policy, it, it's difficult to be angry with them for that. It's, you can be frustrated with them. Um, but I... And this, this was a view you held as, as, as a whip? No, obviously as a whip you try... <laughs> <laughs> obviously as a whip you would, try and, you would try and persuade people. And you would... Um, you would use the argument that unless we hang together, actually, we can't deliver anything. But actually, I would occasionally give a little bit of slack to people in my flock. I mean, the trouble with Brexit is you needed everyone's votes. But sometimes I would give people a little bit of slack if it was an issue where we were going to win anyway, and it was something this person clearly cared a lot about. Yeah. Because what... I mean, I can... The, the trouble thing, with the minority government, uh, even more yeah, than you with Brexit. Everyone, right. yeah. But the, 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 when I was an MP, the most difficult vote I had was on same-sex marriage. And it wasn't actually difficult in one way, because I knew absolutely which way I wanted to vote on the issue. But you did get a lot of people in the constituency contacting you saying, I voted for you, and I don't agree with this, and if you vote for it, I'm not going to vote for you anymore. And um, I, I, I ex experimented with different ways of writing back to these people. And in the end, I found the best reply was to say to them, um, thank you for letting me know what you think. Uh, you're completely entitled to your view. I hope you would rather have an MP who does what he thinks is the right thing, rather than someone who tries to calculate how best to cling on to his job by adding up the numbers on either side. Mm. And actually, a lot of people then wrote back saying, actually, yes, yeah, I, I don't agree with you, and I hope this doesn't happen, but I respect, if, if that is your view, that's what you should do. Um, and so, as I said, I find it difficult to get annoyed with people in politics who are standing up for what they believe in. Mm. Unless it's something wholly offensive, you know, it's... That why do people come into politics if it's not to stand up for what they really think and what, they, what, they, what motivates them, what they believe in? Obviously, it's incredibly difficult when you're trying to get something through and you're saying to people that if you don't compromise, you could get the opposite of what you wanted. Um, and uh, as some people here will, detest, uh, will attest, I wasn't always uh, emollient and lovable. Sometimes I did get frustrated by it. But it, you have to have respect for other people's points of view. Thanks. Here in, the, in the middle, there's someone who's been very patient. 
Hi, my name's Lucy. I work for the RBA. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about me, uh, Whitehall reform in the media in recent weeks, but I was just wondering if you thought that the media actually understands Whitehall. Look, I mean, I would say that most people in most professions feel that the world doesn't understand them. <laughs> Journalists probably feel the world doesn't understand what it's like to be a journalist. Uh, so I, look, I think, I think uh, the media has a reasonable understanding of the Westerners. You know, a load of them are embedded in it, um, but they've never, act, you know, or very few of them have ever actually been civil servants, so you never know something as well as when you've done it yourself. Um, I think that the danger with the debate about civil service reform is you can end up almost talking about caricatures. And the civil service itself is a very varied institution from, you know, the, the absolute sort of uh, top fostering people that I would have dealt in in number 10 to people that are working, delivering our welfare system in, you know, offices around the country to some of the key sort of agencies that we rely on that are sort of semi-autonomous. It is a complex thing with lots of people with lots of different skills. And, you slightly dumb down the debate if you just try and sort of characterise it as the civil service. Um, so I think there is a reasonable degree of understanding, but I, if, you, uh, if you work in any organisation, you probably always feel the media doesn't completely understand what it's actually like. I'm not going to delve into here whether oh, the effect of yes minister on the national <laughs> imagination, but it, it, it's really interesting. Uh, let's come, come here, third row. Hey, hey n n n excuse me, is it? On this question of rotation, I think there's a danger of uh, people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. <laughs> that ministers rotate very fast. There are special reasons why the civil service has started to grow, uh, rotates faster than it used to. It's all about transparency, competition for jobs. You can't say to someone, I'm keeping you there anymore. If they want to apply for a job, they can apply for a job. So that has had an unintended consequence that it needs to, to be addressed. <coughs> Thing I, one of the things I like to do, a lot of things I like to do in the presentation, that is getting to know your field, your parish as a minister. You had two really good predecessors before this great torrent of new House of Ministers. George Young and Nick Rainsford. Between them must have covered 15 years as housing minister, you really got to know that job. And I think that's an important thing we should try to do. Um, the other thing is you said you were going to write a book I might write a book. Well, this book has been written called May at 10. I just wonder whether you thought that was okay or whether you <laughs> think you could do a better job of it or, or whether you thought it was completely unfair or was actually too charitable. Uh, so, yeah, Andrew. where shall I start there? Um, so, the first thing is your point about people in glass houses is entirely right, and I would like to see less turnover of ministers as well for all the same reasons. Although you might say they don't rotate in the way that civil servants do. They go in them and they get they thrown, out, thrown down, out the window. Or, yeah, yeah, around or back or whatever. I mean, I think there is a particular problem with the housing job, which is that the person running sort of health policy, state for health, state for education, that housing is sort of mingled in with local government, community cohesion issues, etc. So the, the minister for housing, who the, who the sector actually see as their person a bit more than the Secretary of State for MMCLG, is seen as sort of one of the most senior Minister of State jobs, so is often used as a sort of rung into Cabinet, and it probably means you get a bit more turnover in that job than you'd get in Secretary of State for Health or Secretary of State for Education. That's a specific housing thing. Uh, I agree with you about George and Nick. I know them both, and uh, you know, I had the opportunity to talk to them quite a lot during my career in different ways, so I think they are, they are examples of what you get by longevity. Uh, in terms of the book, I haven't read it, uh, so I don't want to comment on something uh, that I haven't read. I, I did contribute to it, so Teresa asked me uh, to speak to Anthony um, on her behalf. Uh, so all I can say to you is that of my colleagues who have read it, there are mixed views. Um, I think that uh, Anthony himself will probably acknowledge that writing history sort of immediately after the event is quite a challenging, difficult thing to do but it is probably of real use to people that come afterwards and have the benefit of hindsight and can do a, maybe a more you know, considered view from a longer period in the future that some of that contemporaneous view has been, has been picked up and, and put down on paper. So I don't want to, I don't want to either endorse it or criticise it over. Uh, here on the aisle, we've got a couple of minutes more. Thank you. Hi, uh, Carol Walker. You mentioned your uh, liaison with the... Press spokesman James Slack. I just wondered, uh, 
How much did you get involved in that message that was going out to the media and how much did the Prime Minister herself get involved in that and how difficult was that when you were hurtling towards another big defeat on Brexit, for example? So the, the first thing I, I would want to sort of put on the record, James Slack, who is the Prime Minister's official spokesman, is an outstanding civil servant. Uh, and he, was one, he is one of the most talented people that I have worked with during my entire career. Um, it, actually doing the briefing, as you'll probably know, very rarely. Uh, so I think I did the sort of huddle with him after the Florence speech, after the Mansion House speech, and after we'd secured the deal, because there was clearly so much technical detail in there which I had been absolutely living and breathing, and he hadn't to the same extent, so I think he felt it was helpful to have someone with him uh, to do those three. But other than that, I tended to try and leave doing the briefing to the professionals. Um, and I have the utmost respect for him, because the first time I did it, it was an absolutely terrifying experience. Uh, in terms of deciding what the message should be, you know, he often was best placed to just do that himself, but there would be times when he either needed a steer from the Prime Minister because it was a particular question about her, had she done something, had she talked to X or whatever, or he felt it was a sufficiently important issue that he needed to check with her exactly how she wanted it handled. So that would be quite a common thing where he would come to us and say, I think I'm going to get asked X, are you happy with me replying in this way? But actually doing the briefing would be a, would be a pretty rare thing. Uh, again, it's a bit like this, this sort of question uh, from the lady here. Sometimes it's frustrating because sometimes you know, things get leaked or you don't want to talk about stuff because if you're conducting a negotiation, actually sometimes you want to keep things private until you've tried to land the thing that you're doing. But you, have a, you, you, know, you and your colleagues have a job to do and part of the job of being in government is being accountable and answering questions. So it definitely could sometimes be a frustrating bit of the job, but I always accepted that was part of the job, that you had a right to ask questions and we had to answer them as best we could, and sometimes you can't say everything for actually some good national interest reasons, uh, which is why politicians sometimes, you know, are seen on TV not answering the question that's put to them. Um, although generally, you know, I think one of the things that I used to uh, say to Teresa um, is just to, to, to be a bit more open in, in answering questions because I think sometimes there's too much of a focus in our politics on just sticking to a line to take. I think this is not going to this. Well, I was wondering as you're talking with your background in housing, did you contribute to the advice to her on Grenfell? So yeah, that was, I certainly was one of those people that got that call wrong on that day. Uh, and that was a big mistake. On the first day. Yeah, she should have gone down. So, I mean, I'm not making, it's like the question the gentleman who came through from the other room asked about hmm. rough sleeping. I'm not making excuses. The advice you got from the police was concerned about the security situation there. Uh, and so the sort of view was, well, you, we shouldn't go then. And that was clearly a mistake, and we let her down quite badly with that. And it's taken her... I mean, there is a lot of work that Theresa May did behind the scenes with the various survivors groups that has slowly rebuilt her relationship up with that. But it took her a lot of work and to get back to that position. And, it, you know, we, we badly advised her she should have gone on that first day. Last question at the door. Hi, my name is Harry Pinder. Um, I work in the civil service. I wanted to know uh, specifically around uh, the numerous uh, votes that were done in Parliament and what the um, view was or what the feeling was around the office uh, every single time. Was it were there sometimes where you thought actually it would go through, or or it, I'd just love to get to know some of that. So the first vote was you knew you were going to lose and lose terribly. And there, there's a there is an unfortunate one. There's a there's a, just a reality of Parliament that once everyone knows you're going to lose more people will rebel because they're like, well, at some point I'm going to have to vote for something quite like this, but I can burnish my credentials if I vote against this time. And then, right, so one, once everyone knows you're going down, you're going to go down badly. Um, so that's where we were with the first vote. Uh, the second vote, um, we didn't do quite as well as we hoped, but we got a few key people back on side. So, for example, David Davis backed the deal at the second time. The third one is a really interesting story that I don't know how much time I've got, but um, uh, the third vote was winnable. You know, we, the, the, the situation we had there was we had a group of Labour MPs who were teetering about voting for it. We had got back on side nearly all of the senior Brexiteers, so Boris, 
Don Raab, IDS, all voted uh, for the deal. Uh, Jacob voted for the deal the third time round. Steve Baker didn't. So we were, we were really squeezing down the Conservative rebels and we could have maybe gone a bit further. Uh, and then we came very close to getting the DUP online and the, the on side. And the problem we had was that they were all saying, I'm not going to do this unless I know it's going to work. And you couldn't get the three groups in a room and say, could you just like all agree together, you're going to jump together, because if you do, we're going to win this vote. So the third one, um, we actually came close to winning. And I feel quite strongly about the third vote. Uh, because, and, uh, sorry um, if I'm going over the deadline, but um, the okay. first two votes were on the deal. Right? The first two votes were what we call meaningful votes. They were votes on the deal as a whole. The third vote was not actually a meaningful vote. It was a vote on the withdrawal agreement. In my opinion, there was a very strong majority in that House of Commons for that withdrawal agreement. The Labour Party did not oppose the withdrawal agreement. Uh, and we would have a better withdrawal agreement today if that had gone through. And the, if you remember correctly, what the EU said was, if you, in, if you endorse the withdrawal agreement only, we will extend to this date. But if you don't, you're only getting a two-week extension. So the effect of that vote was to send the Prime Minister back to Brussels with the risk that we would have crashed out two weeks later. It was a highly irresponsible thing, I felt, for the opposition. To, whereas previously I'd understood why they were opposing the deal. They could have backed the withdrawal agreement, withheld their consent from the political declaration and negotiated on that. And I think part that vote, Parliament got wrong, and I feel quite strongly about it, and we came quite close to winning it. So the simple answer to your question is the first two, we knew we weren't going to win, and we knew we were going down by a lot. The third one, we did think we were in with a shout, and I actually think, intellectually, deserve, there was a majority in that House if people had voted on, on what they actually thought rather than politics, that would have passed. I'm afraid we're actually going to have to stop there, but by stop I mean move next door and have a glass of wine and continue with this, whether it is what really happened on Brexit or Prince Harry or whatever. Um, thank, you for, thank you for these terrific questions. I could have a meaningful vote now on whether you should write a book, but everyone's going to say yes because uh, uh, we'd be disposing of, of more of your there time. There may be one person in the room who would not say yes to that question. Right. <laughs> yes. um, other than you. Other than me. You're right. Uh, your wife? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on that note, can you, uh, thank you very much for your questions. Thanks for being an excellent audience. Can you join me in thanking Gavin Barwell?